My name is Susan Shaheen, and I'm a professor of civil and environmental engineering and co-director of the Transportation Sustainability Research Center at the University of California, Berkeley. I'm also the director of the University of California's Institute of Transportation Studies, Resilient and Innovative Mobility Initiative. On behalf of UC Berkeley, UC Davis, UC Irvine, and UCLA. In addition, I am chair of the TRB Executive Committee. I'm delighted to convene the annual meeting's chair's plenary session. We are pleased to be holding this plenary session in lieu of the traditional chair's lunch, so all attendees of the annual meeting can participate. Due to limited seating in the ballroom, the session is being simulcast in session rooms throughout the convention center. I want to welcome all of you in the ballroom with me, as well as those watching remotely. So are you ready to have some fun? Yeah. All right. This past year, I've had the great pleasure and honor of serving as chair of TRB's executive committee. It has been a challenging year for the country and the world, but it has been a delight to have worked alongside thousands of TRB volunteers to help address the challenges brought by COVID-19 while continuing to ensure that transportation equitably and inclusively enhances the lives of everyone. I would be remiss if I did not use this opportunity to wish everyone a belated happy 100th birthday. As many of you know, TRB celebrated its 100th anniversary in 2021. While the 100th meeting was a great success, the virtual format did not allow us to officially conclude the centennial celebration in person as we would have liked. I hope that future TRB volunteers will have better luck celebrating TRB's bicentennial in 2121. As many people know, this session is normally anchored by our keynote speaker. This year, we are changing the format a bit to accommodate the understandably busy schedule of the US Department of Transportation Secretary, Pete Buttigieg. We are honored that the Secretary is taking the time to join us for today's session. I'm personally really psyched. And prior to joining the Biden-Harris administration, Secretary Buttigieg served two terms as mayor of his hometown of South Bend, Indiana. A graduate of Harvard University and a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford, Mr. Buttigieg served for seven years as an officer in the U.S. Navy Reserve, taking a leave of absence from the mayor's office for a deployment to Afghanistan in 2014. Secretary Buttigieg has the monumental task to lead the U.S. Department of Transportation's efforts to implement the historic bipartisan infrastructure law. TRB stands ready to help the Biden-Harris administration, as well as state and local governments, in ensuring that the Secretary's goal of creating a transportation system that works for every American is met. The Secretary is going to start with some opening remarks to be followed by a fireside chat with myself and TRB Executive Committee Vice Chair Nat Ford. So let's get rolling. Please join me with a warm welcome for Secretary Pete Buttigieg, TRB's Chair's Plenary Session Keynote Speaker. Pete, well, the you floor is yours. <laughs> all right, thanks very much, uh, Chair Sheen, first of all, for your leadership, for the introduction, and I wanna thank the TRB Executive Committee for inviting me to speak with you today. I'm uh, very excited to be addressing you at a time when research and innovation, I think, will be playing an exceptionally important role in the decade ahead for transportation. 
I think one of the least known and most important roles of the department where I serve is our role supporting transportation research. And so this audience in particular touches so many important parts of our department's areas of responsibility. TRB, as you know, and more broadly, the National Academies have a very long and distinguished history. Going back to 1863, when President Lincoln created the National Academy of Sciences during the height of the Civil War. And to me, it is telling that a visionary president did this in a period of enormous and urgent crisis, when I think many might have said that he had more pressing things to worry about. He must have understood that the success and even the security of the country depended just as much on science and innovation as on more traditional routes to military and economic strength. One historical nugget that we found uh, as we were preparing for this address is that at that time, the Union was struggling to adapt to a new piece of transportation technology, the ironclad ship. And it was clear that ironclads had replaced wooden ships as the most powerful force on the seas, but they posed a new problem, which was that the iron plating interfered with compass navigation. So the Lincoln administration turned to the National Academy and some of the era's leading scientists to devise a new compass that could keep ironclads on course. We're obviously gathering in a very different American moment, but it's also one right now around us bringing challenges that might have surprising connections to transportation research. We're facing a, a persistent pandemic, an accelerating climate crisis, a country more politically divided than at any time since the Civil War itself. And we're gathering at a moment of enormous opportunity in our field. One of the most significant parts of that opportunity, of course, is the president's historic bipartisan infrastructure law. It's a law that contains some of the most significant investments in our transportation infrastructure in generations, from roads and bridges to transit and rail to electric vehicle infrastructure and research. These investments are going to have a very real impact on our daily lives. They're going to help people save money on gas and save time on their commutes. They're going to help more children take the bus to school without having to worry about being exposed to toxic fumes. They're going to put people to work. They're going to reconnect communities, and I believe they're going to save lives. But all of that promise depends, of course, on whether we succeed in making the most of those investments. We've got to put these funds to work in a focused way to advance our key priorities, jobs, climate, equity, safety, and preparation for the future. And your work will be essential in helping us to do that. Take the example of jobs and economic strength, for example. We know that the middle class has been shrinking, that income inequality has been rising since long before the pandemic. We also know that good transportation policy directly and indirectly creates jobs that help families build generational wealth for the future. So the key is to make sure that opportunities reach the people and places where they're most needed. Last year, I visited the tunnels beneath Atlanta's International Airport, which helped to create a thriving black middle class during its construction simply by ensuring that communities of color had a seat at the table when it came time to award the contracts to build that airfield in the first place. Every transportation decision is inherently, in many ways, a decision about equity. And that's one of the reasons why we're building equity into our grant criteria and strengthening our disadvantaged business enterprise program. But all the money in the world isn't going to make a difference if it doesn't go to the right places. So we need your help to make sure that underserved communities and historically excluded businesses have the technical resources that they need to compete for grants and for business opportunities. I know that last fall, TRB held its inaugural conference on advancing transportation equity. And in the years ahead, we'll be looking to you to help continue to gather the data and make the case on ways for transportation policy to be a powerful tool in the service of fairness and equity. The same could be said about climate environment and environmental justice. We have a commitment as an administration to making sure that 40% of the benefits of our climate and clean energy investments go to underserved and overburdened communities. 20 years ago, President Bush turned to the National Academies for an, uh, an objective assessment on the issue of climate change. And today, the science is beyond question. The climate crisis is upon us, and we are turning to you once again not to describe the problem, but to help us understand the most important and most effective solutions. Then there's safety, the fundamental mission of this department. Most forms of transportation have gotten dramatically safer over the years, but there's a glaring exception, which, of course, is our surface transportation, specifically our roadways. 
If a wide-body jet were to crash in the U.S., it would be a rare, tragic, and newsworthy event, and yet we lose 3,000 people every month to traffic crashes, the equivalent of 10 or more large aircraft falling out of the sky. And we must confront the fact that these tragic deaths are not inevitable, they are preventable. So we need to take new steps, like embracing a safe systems approach nationwide. Very soon, we're going to be rolling out our first ever national roadway safety strategy. And again, we will be counting on those in this audience to help communities across the country develop and implement the ideas reflected in that strategy so that driving can one day be as safe as flying or any other mode of transportation. I'm excited to get to questions, so I, I want to be brief, but I want to close with a subject that I know is of particular interest to the many researchers and planners and, and technologists and thinkers who are here, which is innovation. We're working very hard to make sure innovation isn't just a buzzword that, that loses its meaning, but a means to an end. And in the service of that, we have revealed six or unveiled six guiding principles uh, that are going to uh, help shape our work as a department when it comes to innovation and transportation. So I hope you'll take a moment to get to know these principles. They're going to help guide our investments in deploying the infrastructure law, including things like a fund for major projects that are too large or complex for traditional funding systems where we're going to have to think in new ways. The infrastructure law provides half a billion dollars in funding to the SMART program to kickstart a new generation of smart city innovation. It's investing in university transportation centers that work on climate equity innovation, including HBCUs and other minority-serving institutions. And it even includes a vision to set up a future advanced research projects agency for infrastructure, an ARPA-I, to help scale up our R&D efforts to keep pace with innovation. And at the heart of all of this is an understanding that we shouldn't be acquiring or deploying technology for its own sake, but always using innovation as a powerful tool to advance the goals that I've been discussing in this address, safety, equity, climate, economic strength, and preparing our country for the future. And I know that with your insight and your expertise and your partnership, we will be able to keep this country and the traveling public moving in the right direction for years and for decades to come. So thank you again for the chance to address you, and I look forward to diving into some questions. Thank you so much, Secretary. I wish you could see the room. It's filled with people who are so excited to have you with us. And we really like to geek out here on transportation research. So I think you're in the right place. So <laughs> Nat Ford and I, who's the vice chair of TRB's executive committee along with me, we prepared a few questions for you, but I think you're gonna do well. So let's take a shot at the first one, which is gonna focus on decarbonization. So the Biden-Harris administration has made addressing climate change one of the highest priorities. EPA estimated in 2019 that transportation was one of the sectors with the largest amount of greenhouse gas emissions, with 29% of all GHG emissions in the U.S. itself. What strategies are needed today to realistically reduce transportation emissions to meet the president's 2050 target of zero emissions by 2050? So it's a great question, and uh, to me, one of the biggest opportunities in front of the transportation research community and the transportation sector as a whole. A after all, if we're the biggest sector in the U.S. economy contributing GHGs, then we have an obligation to strive to be the biggest part of the solution. And I see so much activity in that direction, and that's a major focus of our administration. That's true in the hardest to decarbonize sectors like aviation, where we're pressing for uh, swifter development and adoption of sustainable aviation fuels. Uh, the maritime sector, where uh, recently when I was in Glasgow, we were able to partner with a number of countries in the Clyde Bank Declaration to commit to greener shipping. Uh, but of course, it is especially live and urgent when it comes to the surface side. And we really need to think about every dimension of a trip and what can be done to make it greener. Uh, can we use design to reduce the necessity of some of the trips that people take? When people do take trips, can we create alternatives to take those trips in different modes? If the mode is going to be a vehicle, a privately owned vehicle, how do we make sure that that mode is as clean as possible? Which is, of course, why you see such a focus on electric vehicles and zero emission vehicles in this administration, including the ambition uh, to uh, reach the sales targets for EVs that we need by 2030. 
uh, and uh, the continued attention to tailpipe emissions, because no matter how good we are at EV adoption, there are going to be a lot of internal combustion engines on the road for a very long time, and we can't drop the ball on that side of the occasion, uh, equation, even as we're working to drive the adoption of EVs. Um, the other thing I think is really important in the transportation space is it's the space where we can break the old false equation of climate versus jobs. Uh, I've seen so many places around the country where jobs are being created through climate action. Everywhere from the uh, manufacturing facilities that are uh, creating the, the rolling stock and green buses that uh, we are going to help fund uh, cities and transit authorities to adopt, to uh, what we see in terms of the, uh, uh, the aviation sector, as I mentioned earlier, the, the level of ambition uh, for our offshore wind uh, energy sources, which in turn help to drive the strategy for some of our port infrastructure grants. A great example of how energy and transportation policy have to fit together. Housing and transportation policy have to fit together because you know, transit-oriented development is a, a climate opportunity as well as a planning concern. All of these things have to be considered in an integrated way. And uh, that's something you already see in the most forward-thinking communities and states. It's something you see increasingly in the research community. And I'm committed to making sure that that integrated approach is something you'll see in our department as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Secretary. Nat Ford. Uh, in the past year, the uh, supply chain, especially for imported goods, became overwhelmed with the demand exceeding supply, especially during the pre-holiday period, further ex exacerbating the problem where labor shortages across key transportation modes and intermodal transfer locations. Please share with us what the department is doing to address supply chain issues in the short term and in the long term. Well, it's, it's a great question and a timely one. I actually spent yesterday morning in the ports of LA and Long Beach, uh, where they've made enormous progress. But I'll tell you, even though you don't see as many ships uh, building up offshore, that's really because the queuing system has been made more environmentally uh, friendly and smarter. But there, there are more ships than ever uh, bearing down on those ports, just to take one example. Uh, and, and as you mentioned in your question, a lot of this has to do with demand for goods. Uh, I, I want to make sure everyone understands that the ports the workers, uh, whether we're talking about uh, truckers, warehouse workers, certainly the longshore workers at our ports, aren't handling less than they used to. They're not slowing down compared to before. Last year was actually an all-time record high, uh, I believe by 14% over the last highest year uh, in terms of the, the, the throughput. The issue is that the demand is even greater. Uh, and the other issue, of course, is that we see a lot of moments where parts of the system aren't talking to each other in the right way. This is compounded by labor issues, some of which are immediate having to do with the Omicron variant. That's one of the reasons why, uh, even though the Christmas shopping season went dramatically better than a lot of people expected or feared a couple months earlier, uh, actually right now as we speak, we see more issues mounting in terms of the availability of goods uh, due to very acute staffing issues throughout these distribution networks. Uh, uh, owing to Omicron. But there are also things that, that have been building up long before the pandemic. And one example uh, has to do with uh, the quality of trucking jobs, making sure that we are recruiting and retaining uh, people who are working as truckers. Industry estimates that there is a, a gap of about 80,000 truck drivers right now relative to what we need. But at the same time, my department estimates that 300,000 people leave that field every year. So we've got to make sure not only that we're recruiting people into the field, but that it's not a leaky bucket, rather that we make sure that the working conditions and the compensation reflect the fact that those jobs are absolutely essential. If uh, anything uh, healthy has come out of these uh, extremely uh, challenging, frustrating uh, crises and issues that we've dealt with, I think it's a renewed attention to the importance of our supply chains and the workers who constitute them. Uh, if you got a package today, thank a trucker. <laughs> if uh, uh, you enjoyed a gift that was under the tree, uh, thank, a, uh, thank a warehouse worker. Um, if you uh, click on something online and it's on your doorstep two days later, um, thank a, a longshore worker who probably unloaded it. Now, we depend on the human beings and that human factor more than anything. So in short, wh what can we do about all this? First, there's the work of the supply chains uh, task force and some really phenomenal 
problem solving in the short term on the ground to deal with the most acute issues. Really creative ideas from pop-up container yards in Georgia uh, that allow the, the containers that are building up on the port, that, that precious limited port real estate, to be brought off to a, another inland site where there's more room sorted and, and put onto uh, uh, rail uh, assets there to sweeper ships picking up empty containers to fines and fees, sometimes the very threat of which can motivate shippers to get some of those containers out of the way. Things are going to make a difference in the days and weeks ahead. Then you got the bigger picture, longer term issues, uh, which we need to really make generational investments in, which is exactly why this infrastructure bill is right on time. In fact, one of the things we uh, were uh, marking yesterday was a $52 million grant headed to Long Beach uh, to help them establish uh, new on-dock rail, which makes the, the unloading of ships more efficient. Um, comparatively smaller but equally important uh, port operations and, and uh, grant funding going out across the country from the Great Lakes to our inland waterways. And that's just to talk about the port side of the equation. Then you got the trucking, rail, and so forth. Again, all of this fits together. There's no easy solution. Uh, but we know that there are things we can do that will make a difference. The last thing I want to mention, though, is that uh, there are supply chain problems. And then there are supply problems, uh, right? If, if parts of, of China, for example, are facing new shutdowns uh, due to the spread of a variant, that's something we are going to notice here in the U.S. at the mall two months later, no matter how good our transportation systems are. And it's one more reason why the, the kinds of disruptions we're experiencing right now, uh, we won't be able to say goodbye to them for good until we've turned the page and put the pandemic behind us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. So we have another question for you, and this one you've been intimately involved in. So congratulations on the enactment of the bipartisan infrastructure law. We are all very grateful for the major role that you personally played in leading up to the passage of this historic legislation. Now comes the hard part, actual delivery of all the programs and projects that are funded under the law. What is the department doing to ensure that the money gets delivered to states, localities, and others who will have responsibility for delivering the projects funded by the bipartisan infrastructure law and to ease regulatory burdens and other red tape to ensure the money is spent within the five-year target? So this is one of the reasons it's so exciting to work in transportation right now. Uh, you know, so often the main obstacle to getting something done has been funding. And, and yet in so many places on so many projects, we're going to be able to overcome that obstacle. doesn't mean there aren't a lot of other obstacles. And that's why we've got to be very smart from day one, as I believe this administration has been and as my colleagues here at the department have been, about making sure we deploy these dollars effectively. And again, this is an area where we are going to need the research community uh, really side by side with us, uh, making sure we get it right. Let me mention uh, a few things, prioritization, uh, access and equity, and delivery. So prioritization, even though these uh, seem like and are colossal sums of money, they could still go very quickly if we're not very effective and very smart about where these dollars go. Whether we're talking about $17 billion for ports or over 100 uh, for roads or the $1 billion committed to reconnecting communities that may have been divided by transportation decisions in the past. We've got to make sure we identify those opportunities where there's going to be the greatest impact. And that means looking at the big picture of what we need out of transportation for the future. And the answers aren't going to look like they did in the 50s. Uh, to take the highway example alone, uh, we, we can't measure success based purely on how many lane miles were added. We need to add and in some cases subtract or modify what we have to make sure that uh, everything is focused on getting human beings to where they need to be. Uh, we need to be designing around realities that will change within the lifetime of the decisions we're making, right? Uh, a a uh, literally concrete piece of infrastructure right now will be serving an electrified and perhaps increasingly automated world of surface transportation tomorrow, and we've got to be ready for that. So prioritization. Two, access. You mentioned the, the process and how burdensome it can be. We need to make sure that it is a user-friendly process and one that is as accessible to a small community that may not have a full-time federal relations person on staff as it is for our biggest cities. It's very important to make sure that every kind of community uh, feels the impact. And we're actively working on means from technical assistance to just 
simplifying uh, the design. And so many people I know in this community think about things like user experience. And we usually think about that in terms of the, the, the citizen, right? Literally the user of a, uh, of a subway or, uh, or, or a bus system, and that's important. But I'm also thinking about user experience just from the perspective of the city or, or, or whatever staff person is trying to navigate the, the processes. We, need, we have certain requirements. We need accountability on environmental and labor standards on, on making sure we meet our marks. But we don't want to create so many layers to this that, uh, th that it's not possible for many communities to actually take advantage of, of the funding. So we're going to be very focused on access. And then third, delivery. And again, uh, we can't solve this without a, a lot of insight from, from the research world. How do we make sure that we get the most bang for our buck? in transportation and infrastructure spending. Large infrastructure projects are famously inefficient and prone to cost overruns. That is, frankly, even more true in the US context than it is in a lot of other countries. And a lot of that is addressable. So really smart ideas are out there about how to make projects more modular, more scalable, more replicable, more nimble, uh, so that they are on time, on task, on budget. And I can tell you, the president certainly has high expectations uh, for my department and every department in this regard. And we need to work with the, uh, the project sponsors and our implementation, implementation partners to get that right. The last thing I'll just comment on, and one thing I, I find is very different from my experience as a mayor, is that uh, you know, for the most part, we as a department aren't actually buying or building very much compared to what we are funding other entities to do. Right? It's the, the transit agency, the city, the state. Uh, the Port Authority that, that's actually doing the work. Uh, we're creating the conditions to make it possible and providing, increasingly providing the resources. We've got to get that, that handshake right, so to speak, and celebrate those grantees, those project sponsors that are really leading the way, doing things that, that we haven't even thought of um, in, in Washington and doing it right, and then circulate those best practices, get them out there, and have an iterative model where things that are working well can be imitated and replicated quickly, and things that aren't working well, we can uh, pivot away from into something else. Thank you, Secretary. I think Nat Ford has one additional question. Thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary. It was clear in your opening remarks the importance of equity, uh, both social and racial equity, uh, in transportation is a priority of your leadership uh, of the U.S. Department of Transportation. How are you planning to define and implement equity as a factor in U.S. DOT funding decisions? Well, of course, uh, in the first instance, we're always going to be guided by uh, the, the statute from Congress that authorizes us that, that varies from one program to another. Uh, but in accordance with uh, those congressional expectations, we will be putting a focus on quality of life, uh, on uh, making sure that there is fairness in how these dollars go out, and a lot of intention around the fact that uh, it, it hasn't always been true, uh, that uh, many have been excluded uh, from access to transportation. It's one of the reasons I'm excited about the ASAP program, for example, uh, championed by Senator Duckworth, which is going to fund uh, more transit facilities becoming ADA compliant. It's why we need to pay attention to uh, the history of racially disparate access to transportation. And recognize, by the way, that there's nothing exotic about the idea that uh, uh, transportation and uh, racial equality uh, are two stories that go together. Uh, Plessy versus Ferguson was about who got to sit where on a train. The Montgomery bus boycott, about literally about transit and transportation, was of course one of the seminal moments in the civil rights movement. These have always gone together, and when we get it right, uh, we are ensuring that transit and transportation are means to gain opportunity. Uh, and that's going to be a, a consistent focus. We have a departmental office of civil rights uh, that is working to make sure that Title VI requirements and other uh, legal requirements are being met. That's the floor, though. We really want to proactively work with communities seeking to do the right thing, to go over and above the legal minimum so that's not, uh, uh, as much as possible, it's not about enforcing on violations, but, but partnering to make sure that, that the right thing happens. And again, the business opportunities here for workers and business owners alike are, I think, a unique opportunity to build generational wealth in overburdened and underserved communities. And here, too, we need to make sure that we're partnering with a lot of players outside of the public sector to build the kind of capacity that is going to be needed inside the public sector, especially the small and medium-sized business community, uh, so that uh, there are partners ready to run with the opportunities that we're creating in, in large and small communities. If we get this right, 
we will look back with a great deal of pride on how the 2020s uh, were a period when transportation equity reached new levels. And when we do that, that makes not just historically excluded uh, groups better off, it makes the entire country better off uh, because we will have a stronger, more stable, uh, richer, fairer economy for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary Buttigieg, for joining us today and sharing your insights. We are just so thrilled to have you as a partner and are absolutely delighted to be working so closely with all of the modal programs at the Department of Transportation. We heard from many of them today at the TRB Executive Committee. So please count upon us to be there for you, to help you with this historic moment in transportation by providing you with research expertise. So thank you. Well, thank you. We're counting on your partnership, and I'm so glad for the chance to be with you today. Thanks again, and see you soon. So was that fun? All right.